Let me just say thank you so much for joining in with me uh, again today. Uh, it's always a, a great pleasure to have moments like this where we can just join together, uh, spend some time in worship, and, and now just some beautiful time reflecting and growing in God's Word uh, together. But before we get into the Scripture, uh, we got a, a couple special things for us today that we've uh, talked about uh, over the last couple weeks that I want to uh, celebrate with you today. But first of all, uh, let me just remind you that we have our new connect groups that are beginning uh, in the month of September. Uh, and we have a lot of different uh, families that have uh, chosen the opportunity to help uh, facilitate, to lead uh, these various connect groups that will be meeting all throughout the area. Uh, but just like we began last uh, Sunday, also this Sunday and, and the next Sunday to come, uh, we have signups out in the foyer. And so if you would like to be a part of uh, one of these connect groups that will be meeting throughout the area, uh, let me just encourage you to stop by the table in the foyer and just sign up. And if for some reason you don't have time to do that, if you'll just contact us at the church office or send us an email, uh, we just want to encourage you to be a part of these uh, wonderful times of just building relationships, fellowshipping with others, praying with others, uh, just encouraging each other uh, in the body of Christ. And I believe that we can also, uh, through these life, these connect groups, I apologize, uh, these connect groups, just to reach out to some of our neighbors and uh, include them and invite them in to come in to join with us and just enjoy uh, the opportunity of being with others uh, and just growing together uh, in the Lord together. And so uh, once again, if you would like to be a part of one of these, we invite you to join in with us. Just sign up at the table in the foyer or just email the church office or give us a call and just let us know that you'd like to be a part of these connect groups, which will be beginning uh, once again in September. And, and secondly, if you're new, been new to the church, uh, we normally have what we call a Connect to Cornerstone. It's a series of uh, three lunches with some teachings, just some various interactions, uh, some uh, teaching on our beliefs, our values, our missions here at Cornerstone Church, and uh, just some great things that we want to present to you, make available to you. And we would like to invite you to be a part with us uh, in our upcoming series, uh, Connect to Cornerstone. And that will be kicking off on September the 20th, the third Sunday of the month of September. And so uh, it's just been exciting to have these, these times together with you. And we just look forward to more growth together. And once again, if you've been new to the church over the last couple of months, we just invite you to join in with us beginning the third Sunday of September, September the 20th. And, and then to what I've been talking about the last couple of weeks uh, is this, this excitement that we have to experience together with you uh, the, the birth Earning of our, our mortgage note, as we've announced, we had the opportunity to pay off the mortgage uh, here at Cornerstone Church back at the beginning of March. And we were planning to have this great celebration uh, right there in the middle of the month of May. But due, as we recognize, to this pandemic season, we kept pushing it off a little bit further and a little bit further. And it has now really just gotten to the point that we're tired of pushing it off. We just want to celebrate together the, the greatness of God, the faithfulness of God uh, into the life of, of Cornerstone Church. And, and so here in, in just a moment, we're going we're gonna to burn this note that we've been holding on to for several of years. Uh, I've got two pages that I'm going to burn. It's going to be pretty exciting, pretty quick, but I'm going to burn two pages of it so we get a, a full impact of the experience and the excitement uh, of being able to celebrate this freedom that we have or free from this debt uh, from this monthly payment uh, and, and now just free to continue to move forward with what we recognize that God has blessed us with but before I, I burn the note uh, this morning I, I want to take some time to just thank some people, and I'm just going to think it in groups, because if I begin to start saying names, I'm sure I'm going to leave out somebody, somebody's name, and I, I, I for sure don't want to do that. So I, I just want to recognize a, a couple groups of people. First of all, we just like to say thank you to Wood Forest Bank uh, for for trusting in, and I would say believing in us and providing us the, the opportunity to acquire the note. Uh, just a, a quick little short story. Uh, I can't even remember how many banks that I went to 15 years ago uh, with the hopes of being able uh, to acquire the loan, to, to build this building that we believe that God had called us to do. And we just got turned down one bank after the next bank, after the next bank. And, and finally, Wood Forest Bank was willing to, to uh, provide us the loan that was necessary 
necessary uh, in order to, to uh, build this building unto the glory of God. And so we just say thank you to them uh, for their willingness to help us uh, in that journey. I just want to say thank you to the individuals uh, who were willing to be guarantees, uh, guarantors, I would say, of the notes uh, willing to, uh, to stand with me uh, in this journey. Uh, tremendous, tremendous individuals. And I, I just say thank you to you for your willingness to, to help with this. And I, I, I lastly and, and, and want to just say thank you to all of you uh, for your faithfulness to God, just your, your willingness to be generous uh, in just giving as the Lord prompted you to give. Because I believe it was the collective group together that enabled us to get to this point where we could have this great celebration uh, of burning this note, which we're going to do here in just another moment. But I, before I do so, I also want to make you aware that we're uh, renewing our building fund. We, uh, as some of you know, we have plans for a second building uh, that will be a, a gymnasium, some offices, some classrooms, and much more to come that will be out on this side uh, of the church. And we're renewing that building fund. And we just invite you as, once again, the Lord prompts you, the Lord leads you, uh, that you would just be faithful in your giving. And if you, in that giving, that gift that you would offer, if you could just put building fund or just put building on it so that we know where to credit that, that gift toward. And we just, uh, once again, say thank you. Uh, in advance for your faithfulness, because we, we look forward to what God has in store. Uh, one, one of the great reasons why we believe that God has purposed that we would build this building is for community opportunities, outreach opportunities, for, for ministry growth here at Cornerstone Church. And, and we're excited as to where we are right now. But let me say to you that, that we're excited with where we see that God is leading us uh, into the future. And we just ask that you would continue in your faithfulness uh, unto the Lord as the, we will soon to continue to announce uh, this future project and, and what we see that God has in store for it. So without going too much further in all of this, uh, we, we look forward to this for a, a great time. Uh, the opportunity to, to burn this note. And once again, I, I, I have two pages of this. And uh, uh, if you want to shout and scream and holler, I've done this many times throughout this process, just celebrating God's greatness, God's faithfulness uh, into uh, the life of our church here at Cornerstone Church. And so we realize that, that this loan, loan number 201-8528, uh, it, it will be gone forever, no longer to exist because you have helped us to, to eliminate this. And we say thank you and praise to God. And so let me go ahead and just ignite this first page. Wow. And I got one more. Because that was so exciting, so interesting. Let me, let, let me just give one more and then we can clap and shout and give God all of the praise for his, once again, his faithfulness into our, the life of our church. It's not unusual to be What, what an excitement to realize that it, it's gone. And as we said earlier, that we're, we're now debt free here at Cornerstone Church. And we just look forward to what God has in store for us uh, into, the, into the future. And once again, thank you so much for your faithfulness. As always, you can give in the back of the sanctuary at the tables. You can give online at cornerstonechurchconroe.org. Or you can always mail your, your, your giving to the church. And we just say thank you so much uh, for your faithfulness. If you have your Bibles now, if you'll open them up with me to 1 Peter chapter 1. Uh, we began this series that we've entitled Standing Firm Under Stress. we have now into part three of this. Uh, standing firm under stress, and I've entitled today's message, Undeserved Suffering. Undeserved Suffering. We're going to be in 1 Peter chapter 1. We'll look a little bit into chapter 2, chapter 3, and chapter 4 as we, we move through today's message. But if you have your Bible, just open up once again to 1 Peter chapter 1 uh, in the sixth, the sixth verse. And today as I talked, uh, as I shared just a moment ago, we're talking about undeserved suffering. We realize this age-old problem we're going to look at uh, today is that undeserved human suffering. Suffering is one's own sins, oh, own sins, we would say seems just. 
might would even seem right. But where we really struggle and question is, how can God be good and still allow suffering and, and death by disease, by, by earthquakes, by floodings, by, by, by famine, other natural causes? How, how can God allow those types of things to happen, and yet it still seem right, still seem just. How, how can God allow those things to happen, and yet God still be considered good? This is this age-old question that we've struggled with in and over and over and over again in our lives. A good Christian contracts cancer. A baby is born blind. The list can go on and on, and yet the question arises, why? Why? Why does God allow such things to happen? And I, I want to just kind of briefly go through this today and maybe help to answer some of these questions. This, this is perhaps the most difficult question about God. In fact, I, I'm just going to be honest, right here at the very beginning, I, I'm not sure I can completely answer it. I, I'm not sure any of us can completely answer it, but I, I do believe that Scripture gives us some help today. Uh, let me say that our, our, I believe that our, our faith should be encouraged by the mere fact that this is actually a problem to us. We intuitively believe that, that God should be good, that God is holy, that God is powerful. That Jesus, the, the, the supreme example of an innocent person suffering uh, to us, revealed that God is good. If we really think about it, the, the noblest Christians of all time, many who have come to faith through their suffering, affirm with Paul as he identifies in Romans chapter 8, verse 28. We, we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purposes. That even in the midst of our suffering, by faith we realize that, that God is yet still working, that, that God is working to do what? To bring good, to bring something beneficial into our life, to, to bring forth a great witness, a great testimony out of our lives. And, and so before I jump into the meat of this, let, let's look to the scripture for just a moment. First Peter chapter 1. Pick up with me in, in verse 6. It says, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result, here it is, in praise, glory, and in honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. And so today I, I want to just look at two things in regards to Scripture. Uh, first, just some attempted solutions to understand our reason suffering. And, it, and these aren't going to come from Scripture. I'm going to get to the, to, when I get into my second point, get back to the Scripture. But, but these are just some, some, some reasons of suffering that we find in today's world in, in the help to try to understand or to cope with the suffering that we're experiencing. Uh, with that, number one, some escape the problem through atheism or some other form of materialism. I want you to realize that unbelief has its problems too. Once again, unbelief has its problems too. The design, or we would say creation, in the order of the universe and human intelligence argue for the intelligence of a creator. If God is not good, then the goodness that we experience in this universe is then a puzzle. What, what are we doing? Looking at it from the opposite. We, we, we question if God is good because of the bad that we experience. Well, well, how do we identify for the good that we experience? If God is not good, then I, I would have to suggest the good that we experience would have to be puzzling to us. But I would say we experience it because of the good of God. And we realize even in the suffering that God is working, on, working out good on our behalf, we just have to be faithful 
to him? How, how can we account for happy homes, healthy children, and a loving Savior in the spiritual intuition that God is good? It has to be just God's working within our lives. Secondly, some deny that sorrow, sin, and death even exist. They deny the reality of pain. They deny the reality of, of sorrow, the, the, the reality of, of death. These are, are heirs of a mortal mind. Pain seems real. We, we know that it's real. As anyone knows who has ever been to a cemetery, as one uh, has often said, if he did not die, then why did they bury him? We know that pain is real. We know that sorrow is real. Death is real. Just to, to act and to deny it doesn't really bring a reasonable explanation to our suffering. Let me give you just one more. Thirdly, some lay all of pain and suffering on the devil himself. They just believe that all bad is simply because of the devil. I, I read a, one time of a, a fine Christian couple whose baby fell from a window to his death. And this is their response. The devil did it. Can I, can I stop right here and say, I, I think sometimes for whatever reason, we give the devil more credit than what he deserves. We, we, we give him more victories, we might would say. It sounds crazy to say, but we realize that, that he comes to kill, to steal, and, dis, to, and to, to destroy. But I think sometimes we give the devil more victory than the devil deserves. We, we can't forget, as I taught a, a little bit just last week, that the Bible teaches that Satan can act only with God's permission. God, I, I want you to realize, is far stronger than Satan himself. I, I believe this approach, and that approach is blaming everything on the devil, has limits and solves nothing within our lives. These are just three common, common reasonings for suffering that we find uh, in the world that we live in. So back to scripture number two for us today. And this is really my last slide. I just have two thoughts for you today. Some reasons to trust, to trust in God's goodness, even in the experience of suffering. One more time. Some, some reasons to trust in God's goodness, even in the experience of suffering. Number one, because God knows all. God knows all. Oh, it's hard maybe for us to admit, but we only have partial understanding. We, we only have partial knowledge. Uh, let, let, me, let me give it to you this way. We, we see the dark cloud, the rain cloud, the dark cloud. We, we see it from beneath. So to us, it's just dark. But, but to God, but to God, God sees the sun that is shining down on that dark cloud. Why? Because God sees the cloud from above. God sees all. God knows all. God understands all. For us, we're just, we're living with a, a partial understanding, a, a partial knowledge. This, this is where Job and his friends were at. They, they wrestled with the problem of suffering, uh, the, the, the terrible experience that Job was going through, that those around him was going through. Yet Job concluded that God is so great and wonderful as evidenced by his creation that we can trust God in all circumstances. We, we find this understanding at the end uh, of, of the book of Job, Job 38 through 40. Let, let's get all the way to, to verse, uh, excuse me, to chapter 42. I just want to read part of this to you. Uh, this is Job's response. Job 42, picking up with me in verse 1. Then Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do all things. No plan of yours can be thwarted. You ask, who is this that obscures my counsel without knowledge? Surely, I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. You said, listen now, and I will speak. I will question you, and you shall answer me. He concludes this with saying, my ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. 
Therefore, I, I despise myself and I repent in dushes and ashes. Uh, he was saying, how, how dare I question God? How, how dare we question God? We, we're living with just a limited understanding, a, a, a limited knowledge, a, a limited sight. But God sees it all. God knows it all. God, God understands. And, and hear me this, this, this morning, church. Even when we don't recognize that God is working, we have faith that yet God is still working on our behalf. Because as, as Paul says, we realize that God is working out all things, working out all things for the good of those who love him and who have been called according to his purpose. So, so number one, we realize that God knows all. And let me conclude it with this. Such trust, I think, can be illustrated by this little, little thought of a father and his boy that were walking deep into the woods. The father asked his son, son, do you know the way home? The boy simply her father, no, but I know that you do. We may not know the way through our suffering, but God does. And if we can hold on to God, just as God has brought us through before, we realize and we trust that God will lead us through again. Secondly, suffering may be used for growth in faith and also character. For growth in faith, and character as a hot fire back here in first Peter chapter 1 verse 6 and 7 brings to our attention as a hot fire is necessary to separate dross from pure gold the fire of suffering is used to purify our faith Satan was allowed to to sift Peter as wheat as we we found in Luke chapter 22 last week to sift Peter as wheat as wheat is threshed to separate grain from the shaft I, I realized that the process was not pleasant but hear me it didn't hurt the wheat it allowed the wheat to become what it was created in purpose for it to become it was through the trials the testing of his faith that that Peter's faith grew that his character grew and that he became what God purposed for him to become. Paul prayed earnestly for the removal of the thorn in his flesh that he thought was hurting his ministry. God didn't take it away, didn't take away the, the thorn, but, but he did give grace to bear, to bear to stands. And Paul lived to see that the suffering of the thorn actually made his ministry better suffering sometimes can use to bring growth to our faith and growth to our character number three for you suffering may be used to reclaim a backslidden or one or maybe possibly to convict the unsaved person God identifies to us that he loves us so much that at times he disciplines us and he goes on to say what what child isn't disciplined by his father and we discipline, not, not because we're wanting to be difficult. We're, we're disciplining because we're wanting to bring correction. We're, wa we're wanting to bring help into our child's life. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 5 uh, puts it this way. And, and you have forgotten the word of encouragement that addresses you as sons. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. And do not lose heart when he rebukes you. Because the Lord disciplines those he loves disciplines those he loves it says and he punishes everyone he accepts as a son endure hardship as discipline for God is treating you as sons for what son is not disciplined by his father if you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline then you are illegitimate children and not true sons moreover we have all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respect them for it. How much more should we submit to the father of our spirits and live? He says, our fathers, our fathers disciplined us for a little while as they thought best. But God disciplines us for our good that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it concludes, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Suffering, suffering sometimes can reclaim those 
through discipline who have drifted away. Those who we would say had backslidden. Suffering sometimes can be that which brings a lost person into relationship with Jesus Christ. I read of a young mother who died unexpectedly just a few days after giving birth to her newborn child. It seemed like an absolute tragedy within the family. However, the story goes on to say that her death, mysteriously but just uniquely through the working of God within his life, that, that the death of, of, of his child convicted the father of his sin to the point that he was willing to become a believer of Jesus Christ, to become a Christian. And it was her death that was necessary. I, I can't explain it, but it was her death that was necessary to convict the hard heart of her father. And so ultimately, we would say that it was good. Why? Because God is always working in those difficult situations, those times of suffering within our lives. Just a couple more, and then I'm going to conclude this. Suffering, number four, may be used to make individuals more sympathetic. Think of it. If this world had no pain and no suffering, then this world would have no concern or sympathy. If we lived in a world that there would be no concern and, and sympathy, could we just say how callous, how cold that this world probably would be? But it was suffering. It's suffering that caused people to develop concern and sympathy one toward each other. Uh, number five for you, suffering, I believe, helps Christians to understand the suffering of Jesus Christ. One more time, number five, suffering helps Christians to understand Jesus' suffering. If you have your scripture, let's just look at a couple more. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 2. Pick up with me now in the, in the 19th verse. It says, for it is commendable if a man bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because he is conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it. But if, you're suffer, if, you're, if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this, he says, you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you, ex you an example that, that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, verse 22 says, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. And I'll conclude in verse 24 and 25. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. It's by his wounds that you have been healed. For you are like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and the overseer of your souls. Once again, it's, it's suffering that helps you and I to understand the suffering of Jesus. It's the suffering for doing good. Not, not the suffering for doing wrong, but the suffering for doing nothing but good, but yet still experience suffering. We realize that, that Jesus is the supreme example of the innocent, the innocent suffering for the guilty. Once again, he is the supreme example of the innocent suffering for the guilty. And I want you to catch this for just a moment. He thanked God for the opportunity to suffer on behalf of the guilty. Think back when they had the Lord's Supper. He took the bread and broke it, symbolizing his body that was going to be, be, be tormented and crucified. He took the, bear, the bread and broke it, the Bible says, and he gave thanks and then he passed it to his disciples. Then he took the cup, the wine, representing his, his own blood that was going to be shed on Calvary. Though he was in it to, innocent to be shed for the guilty, he took the cup and he gave thanks. And then he passed it along to his disciples. That, that he would give thanks 
for the opportunity as an innocent individual to suffer for those who were guilty. He, he believed that God would bring good out of evil. And so God did. And there, Jesus endured the cross. And as he endured the cross, Hebrews 12 tells us that he discovered joy in that moment of suffering, that, that he discovered joy. Why? Because he realized his father, God, was bringing good out of this evil experience. Isaiah 53 says, he fulfilled God's promise spoken through Isaiah about the Messiah in Isaiah 53 that, that after, after he has suffered, he will see the light of light and be satisfied. Once again, number five, suffering, I believe, helps Christians to understand the suffering of Jesus Christ. That is suffering for doing good. And lastly, suffering for Jesus' sake causes those who suffer to be truly blessed. That those who suffer for Jesus would be truly blessed. They know that, that God knows all about it. What is it? That, that God knows all about their suffering. And that he stands on the sides of those who have been loyal to him. And he stands at our side at any cost. Just as he stood at the, the side of Jesus and, and brought Jesus back to life, renewed the life of Christ, that he had the power to raise him from the dead. I want you to know that God has the power as he stands next to us to deliver us from any suffering that we may experience in life and to bring good about it. Because of it, we can celebrate. We can experience the joy of Jesus Christ even in the midst of the suffering because we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God is going to bring good about because of the suffering. Let me just give you a few scriptures as I begin to conclude today's message. Just hear these. Matthew 5, uh, verse 10 and 12, it says, Blessed, here it is, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. He goes on to say, rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Once again, lastly, number six, suffering for Jesus' sake causes those who suffer to be truly blessed. Let, let's go back to 1 Peter. Look at it, 1 Peter chapter 3. Let me just give you a couple verses. Verse 8, it says, Finally, all of you live in harmony with one another. Be sympathetic. Love as brothers. Be compassionate and humble. Verse 9, do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult, but with blessing, because to this you were called. Uh, maybe later on today, go, go and read all the way down, all the way down, through, read, read through verse 18 here, 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 through 18. Uh, turn over another chapter, 1 Peter uh, chapter 4, pick up with me in the 12th verse. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12, it reads, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial that you are suffering, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice, rejoice that, that you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when His glory is revealed. Once again, maybe a little bit later, go on and read all the way through Verse 19, simply what I want you to know, that suffering for Jesus, for the sake of Jesus, I believe brings a blessing, a tremendous blessing into each one of our lives. So once again, as I conclude today's message, simply have faith in God. Have faith in God. Along with that, believe in Jesus I want you to realize that, that Jesus was sure about God. 
It, it, we know that for certain, that, that Jesus was, was sure about God. How, how could anyone be as good, as good as Jesus if God were not good? Think about that. How, how could anyone be as good as Jesus if God was not good? Because Jesus always talked about his relationship with his father, how loving his father was, how, how good his father was. He would uh, walk in relationship, uh, fellowship with his father, God. And we, we see how good, how blessed of a life that Jesus lived. And I don't know about you, but I think we all want that. We all want to walk in that joy. We want to walk in that contentment of life. And Jesus discovered that by walking with his father, God. You and I can discover that by walking with God ourselves, even in the midst of the suffering. Why? Because we realize that our suffering is producing something tremendous in our lives. Back to 1 Peter. He says, all kinds of trials last only a little while. But he says, but praise, glory, and honor will last forever. John goes on to say, Jesus goes on to say in the book of John, you do not realize now what I am doing but later, you will understand. I mean, we, we don't understand all of the suffering. We don't always understand everything that God is doing. But I want you to realize, if you don't get anything else, that God is working good about in your life. Many believers who have the strongest faith in God are those who have suffered the most. I believe this should encourage us at least to some measure today. To do what? To trust in God and never to give up. To trust in God and not be afraid. I mean, I, I realize that we all, we all have stresses. We're, we're talking about standing firm under stress. And, and one of these stresses is what we classify as this undeserved suffering. Suffering for doing good. But I, I want you to know that God is faithful. And God will equip us. God, God will enable us to stand. And, and to stand with joy. To stand with peace. And to stand to give praise, glory, and honor to God. That we realize will last forever and ever. And so this morning, I just want to pray over your life today. I, I want to agree with you today that, that God will yet equip you, strengthen you, provide courage into your life to stand in the midst of suffering and to realize that he's working good on your behalf. So let's look to him together this morning. Father, I just say thank you, Lord, for your word. God, thank you for your truth today. Father, I pray for my friend. But I realize that, that stress is real. I realize that suffering is real. I realize that there are times the enemy comes to kill, to steal and destroy. But you've come that we might have life and that we might have it more abundantly. God, and I, I pray your, the goodness of your life, your abundant life over my friend today, oh God strengthening their life, encouraging their life, that we not give up, but we hold firm, that we hold strong, that, that we keep standing in the midst of the suffering, knowing that you're working good on our behalf, that we're walking in your blessings, and that there are great experiences to come. Father, and we say thank you for that, and we honor you. God, and by honoring you, we daily commit our life to you, to your glory. God, trusting that your will would be accomplished. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you so much for joining in uh, with me again today. As always, I trust in the blessings of God over your life. Be blessed.